Breed love, my man. How are you? Are you ready? I'm good, Peter. I'm ready. Thanks for having me. Man, always good to have you. You are the man of the moment. Love talking to you. Okay, listen, before we get into this, and I think this will be, as we talked about before, I think this will be multi-part. I've got a few things I want to ask you about before we get into it. I think a really important starting point is defining what violence is in the term of this conversation. Because when we think of violence traditionally, for example, today I was I was explaining the concept to my son when, of the sovereign individual. Um, he thinks of violence as somebody attacking physically attacking somebody mm. but in terms of the book violence is more than just physical attacks on people which result in injury so for the sake of this conversation can we just define what violence refers to or the scope of violence yeah in the scope of the sovereign individual i would say you could sum it up in that it's viewing violence which you could also say violence or coercion could just be the threat of violence or force, you know, um, influencing human action in the shadow of violence, you could say is, is coercion. Um, you, you know, you pay your taxes so you don't go to jail kind of thing. And this has been, as the book lays out a dominant resource strategy historically. Um, so it started and the proper way to think about government in this long arc of history is that once we settled down in the agricultural age and we started to accumulate surplus, economic surplus, right? We're producing grain, uh, you know, cattle, whatever the output of the farm is, we needed to protect that from plunderers, from outsiders coming in to steal uh, whatever the surplus was. And government emerged on the free market essentially as a protection service for that economic surplus. So you could say that you needed violence to protect from violence, to insulate the productive economy from violence itself. Um, and that's, that's really the, the, the framing of it in the, throughout the rest of this book. And then it, it explores how that protection service, that monopoly on violence, uh, tends to become oppressive over time. You know, they start to abuse the privilege like, like most monopolies do, they abuse their monopolistic uh, privileges on society over time. And how this, how the, the actual the logic of violence, which is largely driven by technology, the cost of attack versus the cost of defense, how this shapes the lines across which human beings organize themselves throughout history. Um, and I, just, yeah, I found it to be a very interesting way to look at things. Um, they explore, the authors had written prior books on the gunpowder revolution uh, and a couple of other things that, that actually zeroed in on some of this. Um, I, I guess one simple example would be the knight on horseback in the feudal age, you know, a fully armored knight could essentially wield force over a large group of peasants. You know, he could, he could go out and violently... Um, win in a, in a bout with, with, you know, say 40 cousins or so. But once the invention of the rifle occurred and the gunpowder revolution, all of a sudden the, the symmetry of violence reverted back to favor the peasants where they could defend from a night at, you know, hundreds of hundred yards away. Um, so these little technological shifts dramatically influence how society organizes itself. Uh, the last point there. The knight himself, by the way, an even more simplistic innovation made him possible is you needed the stirrup, actually, so he could mount the horse. Otherwise, the knight was on foot and he couldn't really move force across space easily. So something as simple as the stirrup enabled the knight to become the dominant uh, military force in the feudal age. So what we're really discussing in this book is it's not the eradication of violence, it's that violence exists between humans and the logic changes with different technical innovations and the logic has changed through to the agricultural revolution, through the industrial revolution, and we expect to change through this information revolution. But it's all that changes is the logic in line with techno technological advances. That's right. The I would say the logic of the incentives to violence as well. Um, the big change in the digital age, which I'm sure we'll get into, is that 
encryption technology allows us to secure property in a way that's, all, you know, when done properly, immune to violent or unilateral, <clears throat> excuse me, confiscation or coercion. So, you know, the clear case here is Bitcoin. If you properly custody your Bitcoin, uh, you know, in a redundant multi-signature geographically dispersed scheme, there's not, we always talk about the $5 wrench attack. That's what this is all about. It's, you can now put money in a place uh, that I actually analogize later on, and the authors do as well, to the ultimate offshore bank. It's a place behind this impenetrable wall um, that cannot be compromised, essentially. So this radically changes the nature of the nation state, which is premised on unilateral value flows. They have, you know, they send you a tax bill that you do not negotiate. You don't negotiate the rate. You don't negotiate the services that you receive. And you also have no say so at all in state inflation revenue, where they're just printing money to paper over, uh, you know, either prior losses or to, to satisfy future expenditure at will. And citizens have no say so in that. Um, so the big, big change here is that citizens, the punchline, I guess, is that citizens end up being treated more like customers of governments in the future than they than they are employees. So we could say employees, as employees of an organization, we just kind of have this democratic voice governance mechanism. We can voice our opinion through our vote or what have you. The majority wins. So there's a tyranny of the majority. And then also your our our the will and intention of the majority sort of gets obfuscated in the electoral process. Whereas in a when you're a customer based um, citizen, you have exit. You have the optionality of exit. So you don't like how the government's treating you. Well, then your Bitcoin goes everywhere at the speed of light, and there's not there's no capital controls. There's no confiscation. There's nothing any state can uh, do to to prevent that. So therefore, they have to negotiate with you more fairly. They have to treat you better. They have to treat you like a customer. Um, whose loyalty they are trying to earn, like every other free market enterprise in the world. And just remind me for a second, because I haven't noted this down. When was this book written? This book was written in 1997. 1997. Okay, so what we're trying to do here for the people who are listening is that if they haven't read The Sovereign Individual, hopefully they will purchase a copy and read it. It's uh, it's in a high demand right now. Um, but we're trying to extrapolate some of the ideas from that in a world where we now have Bitcoin and know that Bitcoin exists. So. This is what we're going to try and do with this interview, uh, interviews, maybe multiple interviews, is talk through the book, talk through the learnings, but I'll kind of relate this to Bitcoin. One thing the book I think does really interesting, uh, does really well and in an interesting way is that when it discusses the industrial age and the agricultural revolution uh, uh, in a historical context and explains exactly what happens, uh, but then when it moves on to talk about the information age, in a very similar tone, it explains what will happen, but that is a prediction. So just an easy first question for you before we start getting into the details. This book is a theory, but is for you, is it an inevitability or is it something that is possible that you're preparing for? I certainly don't believe in the concept of inevitability. You know, there's a certainly a feedback loop. Yeah, I put Bitcoin in that camp too, right? It's, you know, the, the threat of a black swan, which is by definition an unknowable unknown, always exists. Right? We live in, an, in a universe pervaded by chaos and entropy. Anything can happen. We, we don't know, you know. So I don't think the book is laying out an inevitability, but they are tracing the historical changes in social organization based on this seemingly simple dynamic between kind of, the, again, as we said, the cost of attack versus the cost of defense. And I found that this is the same as when you're looking into the future, it's very difficult to predict the future, but you can get a directional idea looking at economics, right? So we could have, 
not to say this would have been easy, but like even looking at something like Amazon and say the late nineties, early two thousands, like they, that business model was premised on decreasing the cost of distribution and doing it in a more timely manner. So a manner more in sync, more harmonized to, to the customer demand. Those types of business models tend to win out. So when you can decrease the cost of distribution, that is related to expansion of the network, the proliferation of the network. And in this case, um, the book's looking at the information age, which, which I call the digital age, uh, whatever we're going to name it here. Um, when you collapse the cost of information, you've thrown a, like the very purpose of the firm, by the way, these, the, what we are accustomed to organizing ourselves within the corporation or the large nation state is to make transaction and information costs to be able to amortize those uh, into the, the size of the firm. So to decrease the cost of information by, by having um, trusted, more trusted in interaction within the firm. But the, the authors make the point that when you decrease this cost significantly, that the actual purpose of the firm gets called into question. So people are more likely to self-organize themselves um, in new and, and unique forms. And in a world where, you know, in the industrial age where decree mattered so much, where the actual law of the land was important because everything was done physically, right? So that you could leverage your physical presence over capital. So another example they go into is how unions would, if they didn't like the wages they were being paid, they would just strike, right? They could strike in place. They could occupy the factory. They could stop production because the production occurred in a physical location that gave them a violent or coercive leverage over that immovable capital. Um, but the digital age, where we have much more products and services that are of an informational content, less less uh, physical capital is involved in many of the business models in the digital age, that option does not exist. The, there's a natural defender's advantage or defensive advantage um, that, that gives people a, a lot of options to, to move elsewhere to where they're treated best. So the, it, it's almost as if um, coercion seeds to civilization in the digital age, because it just doesn't work as well anymore. Now, clearly, this is not a blanket generalization to all industries. There's certain things that are still going to be factory based, possibly probably still unionized for many years to come. But it is to say that the flow of economic energy is away from physical industrial based industry to digital non non local industry. And that as that energy and productivity flows into digital space, coercion does not work there because everyone has, you know, cus or business owners and customers have optionality uh, to the extent that they've never had before. Do you see, with regards to that industrial age example you gave, do you see the coercion working both ways in that, um, obviously, you discussed unions working together to coerce the, what they want, but there is a reality also that those people within the production line have no ability to differentiate themselves because uh, every job is kind of graded on a specific uh, uh, part of the production line, and that person can be replaced with another person. So people don't have a chance to be more productive. They don't have a chance to differentiate themselves. So you tend to get those kind of pay grades. Um, do you see the fact that actually it's like a bi-directional coercive relationship at times? Because also some of these people are perhaps under threat that it's very difficult for them to move off and perhaps do another job, move into another industry, perhaps wherever they're, you know, let's talk about what happened in the motor trade up in Detroit, right? It's very difficult with those people who are so conditioned to that single job within that single uh, 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 employer that also that they could be essentially uh, have kind of abusive treatment from the, the plant owner. So can it be bi-directional coercion? Yeah, so it's a constant negotiation, right? It's every employment is at will. So if you as an employee, you do not like 
the wage you are receiving, then it is incumbent upon you to go out and develop your skill set for alternative employment. Now, as far as it being, it would only be coercive to the extent that an employer could prevent an employee from seeking another job, um, which, by the way, we should probably back up a little here. There's a Mises makes this point in human action that we have this framework today where we think, you know, jobs are, are sacred. It's almost like a human right. We need to op- the government needs to make jobs happen and all of this. The only way <laughs> to have uh, minimized unemployment is to remove interventionism from the economy. So every time, for instance, when we increase the minimum wage, we have increased the price of labor. So we are now, uh, there are people that are, would be willing to work for a lower price, but because there is a government mandated price on labor, they are unable to get employment. So minimum wage creates unemployment, the very phenomenon it is intended to resolve. And this is true, and Mises goes into depth on this, but every government action, by the way, now this is a big one to swallow, but when a government has to push something by decree, they are necessarily taking factors, productive factors, out of the free market. So you can think of the free market, whatever is happening in the free market, a truly unhampered free market, would be the voice of the people. Consumers are sovereign. Consumers are buying and selling. Whatever they, wherever there are profits to be made, that's indicative of consumer, that's unsatisfied consumer demand. So entrepreneurs would go there and satisfy that want. As soon as a government says, I'm going to tax you here to do something that the market's not doing, they've now restricted the sovereignty of consumers to go and reallocate that capital towards satisfying a political, an arbitrary political government established aim at the cost of market participants having their own wants satisfied. We have unemployment. Unemployment is an issue in the world, as Mises calls this, institutional unemployment. So, it exists and is a problem because of government intervention. So our, our misconception here is that we think we need more legislation or more minimum wage or whatever law to fix unemployment, when in fact, the opposite is true from a first principle standpoint. is like you need to withdraw human intervention from the marketplace. That's how you achieve full employment. In that instance where we would say there's this bilateral coercive relationship between employee and employer, that's more likely to only be the case when there's intervention, when there's government intervention. Because in a free market, that employee is going to have the widest range of options to go and sell their labor to someone else if they're not being treated well. Um, so it's all about, I guess, creating these opportunities to vote with your feet. You know, we're talking about uh, citizens having the ability to vote with their feet by taking Bitcoin to leave to another jurisdiction, employees being able to vote with their feet by leaving an employer to go to an alternative. This, the option to exit keeps everyone honest it is kind of the gist of it. And um, yeah, I think that the, this relationship in that, in that case is least coercive. Um, but, you know, to your point that the it can go both ways, it can absolutely go both ways. There's there's a natural, I guess, human predilection to want to get something for nothing. Right. I think the something for nothing is what's at the heart of all this is what the heart it's at the heart of central banking. Frankly, we we want to produce money and create economic activity by just printing dollars. Um, central bank shareholders want shares in the central bank so they can profit from that money production from doing nothing. They just get seniorage on, on this money production. Union workers want to get paid more, even though the market's not bearing that out. So they'll physically commandeer a plant and demand more. And so uh, there's just this human, mm, I guess, yeah, predilection to want us to um, try to steal or confiscate or get some, get more, uh, gain more value than they've created. Let's say, And that's where the importance of historically was the state's purpose was to prevent that, 
to prevent fraud, to prevent the use of coercion and violence such that an economic network could flourish. And, but clearly the state has now become that abuser. So now we're moving into this world where Bitcoin actually gives us a fair game. It's a game where that, those strategies are neutralized effectively so that the dominant strategy becomes long-term cooperation. That's how you're going to create the most value. And the, the authors go into that. They say that you know, trust and reputation are likely to make a major comeback because uh, you know, of the irreversibility of some of this. If you can steal a bunch of Bitcoin, no one, you can't undo that. You can't go into the courts and fix that. So it's, they think that um, the world will move towards something more like we saw, I think it was in the, I forget what age they referenced, but um, where it was based much more on, first of all, your ability to be productive and then your reputation for being productive. And you would come to trust that instead of, um, you know, reliance on coercion to fix any, any problems in, uh, in economic relationships. In terms of how we're going to structure this, there's quite a lot in the book. There's historical context we're going to cover. Um, but we should do the setup for people as well. As I said, you should, you should buy the book. People should buy the book if they can get hold of it. If they can't, they can definitely get hold of the Audible. It's on LOP's website, I believe. Okay. There's a free free PDF. Uh, and it is it has been sold out on Amazon. It's back ordered right now. Right, okay. Well, I've seen it quite from some quite expensive listings for it as well. Um, I've managed to get me a copy, um, but I've been doing the audiobook version as walking. But what we're really talking about here is we're going to be getting into what what the authors talk about as how the logical violence will change during the this information age that we're in and reference to the the virtual community and what microprocessors have brought to the table um do you want to talk about that and how how this is how this is actually changing the logic of violence but more of the setup because and once we've done that we we will move on to talking about uh bitcoin as the kind of ultimate offshore bank yeah so i think it can help a quote that framed this up for me really nicely, and I think it was mentioned in the book, but it's that, quote, technology is advancing much faster than our ability to understand its implications, unquote. And I think that's what this is all about. And it's another version of Andreessen Horowitz's infamous quote that software is eating the world. Um. To me, that, that phrase rings louder every year. You know, it's what we originally thought, oh, who needs a website? These things are just some weird, new, fancy thing. You know, 10 years later, everyone needs a website. It's a must. Then comes the mobile wave where we have everyone needs an app or you need to be engaged with these, these uh, mobile apps. And so it's changed business. You can't really be in any industry now and not be at least tangentially in the technology business. You're running your business on this, on digital software. That's true for everyone in the world. Otherwise you're being outcompeted. But I think it's also eating our institutional models. It's eating the way we have organized ourselves for hundreds of years. So it is one of these, the author's going to these, uh, which is kind of a fourth turning thing, I, I guess that every 500 years we have these major shifts. Um, and we are living through one, which is really interesting. And, and frankly, we're one year in to the inflection point, I think, which was COVID. All right, COVID was a massive accelerant on this transition from industrial to digital age. We already had a lot of the groundwork laid, but people weren't working remote as much. People weren't forced to shelter in place. And by forcing people to shelter in place, it seems like people started to study a lot more about what's going on, right? I, I don't know which I assume, you know, your educational content and uh, a lot of the Bitcoin community, I think, has contributed to that along with Bitcoin number go up, which really amplifies the whole message, coupled with distrust in government rising as the state response to COVID was just, uh, you know, abysmal. So it's this, it's this snowballing effect that seems to have gone really parabolic in the past 12 months. And I guess the, the theme here is that Digital tools 
they're antiquating the nation state model. The, the nation state model is based on forcible human organization. So as the authors say, they treated taxpayers like cattle, that they just could corral them and pretty much take whatever they needed from them, right? Cut them down whenever it was necessary. But digital technology empowers individuals, as we've touched on a little bit, in radical and novel ways that that change the balance of power between nation state and citizen. And this all sounds maybe hyperbolic, especially if you're just, you know, we're born into this world. There are, there's capital and institutions around us that things are flowing. We kind of take it for granted, right? We just, it just is the way of life. We think through our own little limited view of reality, we think this is just the way things are. Therefore, it's, it's, the way it's, it's the way it always has been. Therefore, it's the way it always will be. But when you start to study history, you see that this is not the way it has always been. Not, not, not even close. Um, and the way I like to think about this is that man, like we're constantly optimizing for more energy efficient modes of action, basically. So the, the overarching purpose of man is to channel energy across space and time to satisfy his wants. And we want to do that. We want to use less energy to satisfy more wants, right? That is productivity in a nutshell. And in that way, we innovate tools, right? We can, the classic example, we can go out and dig more holes for a man hour with a shovel than we can on bare hands. And we also innovate models of society, models of socioeconomic organization, that that I think is the proper framing. Is we st- if you start to look at human organization itself as a social device, as a tool for allocating energy, then you can start to compare which ones are more or less efficient. And if we look at something like the 20th century, where we had this ideological and economic contention between Soviet Russia and capitalistic in quotation marks United States. Because it was essentially a free market and everything except money, um, we saw that play out. The, the resource strategy implemented by the United States outcompeted USSR because they were leveraging uh, more of the more free market intelligence, if you will. So they had the intelligence of every economic actor behaving in their own self interest, guided by the profit motive and the price signal um, to generate more wealth. Whereas the USSR depended on this false sense of, they tried to replace the profit motive with a devotion to nationalistic faith. And they tried to, instead of the price signal, they wanted to command and control all economic decisions. And so you had centralized computing, essentially the USSR competing with decentralized computing in the United States free market. And the, the decentralized mode of human organization always outcompetes the centralized mode. Not only is it more intelligence, it can more intelligent, it can bring more force to bear, but it also is composed like an open source network, if you will, is composed more so of voluntarily adopted rules. And this is very important. In a you know fundamentally capitalistic society, the rules are basically just preservation of life, liberty, property. Now, clearly, we're not a pure capitalist society, but I would say the United States was much closer to that ideal than Soviet Russia, whereas a a tyrannical society has to impose all of the rules. There are enforcement and security costs uh, necessary to impose that rule set. So for that reason, again, we talk about decreasing the cost of distribution leads to an increasing proliferation of the network. If we decrease the cost of distribution of information and energy in a free market, then it's going to proliferate more as a network. It's going to create more wealth and it's going to outcompete something like uh, a centrally planned model in Soviet Russia. So this is the thing. It's like, so capitalism as a tool is better than communism. But capitalism, now this is where it gets a little tricky because the language has been abused. We don't have capitalism in the world, right? Central banking is anti-capitalistic. It is, it is a monopoly. Monopolies, legal monopolies do not exist in pure capitalism. 
That's why I created this new term for a Bitcoin-based mode of socioeconomic organization where no one can monopolize Bitcoin, finally. So the, the theory here, I guess, is that as more capital moves into Bitcoin, that we that changes the shape of socioeconomic organization towards a more purified form of capitalism, which I've called sovereignism here uh, in, in homage to the series. And that mode will outcompete state capitalism as a resource strategy. It will attract the best and brightest citizens into it because it's a, it's a fair rule set. It's a place where people can protect the fruits of their own labor and can maximize their optionality and wealth creation over time. So that's the mega political transition here. It's like for the same, in the same way and for the same reasons, capitalism outcompetes communism, sovereignism outcompetes capitalism. And we're starting to see the early stages of this happening. Um, A number of things you said have reminded me of a conversation I had recently with Balaji, but also something he put out. He tweeted recently. It's a really interesting point that made me think about it for a while. But he said we need to stop thinking in terms of the developed world and the developing world world i'm not sure if you saw this but he said we need to think of the ascending and the descending world and it's a really good point because in reference to the united states it's definitely part of the developed world but i see a solid argument for why it's part of the part of the descending world uh, we've seen the infrastructure breakdowns in texas recently we've seen the massive queues during the covid crisis for food uh, we've seen re- ridiculous uh stimulus package upon stimulus package which is you know pushing us towards uh i say we're pushing america towards a more socialist state it it isn't obviously a pure socialist state but there's certainly aspects of uh, um uh interventionalism where there's like this redistribution of income which we always know is in and always know is inefficient uh, the 1.9 trillion doesn't work out of the $1,400 stimulus checks each. It's something like I think Pierre Rochard talked about it. About, that would have been five and a half thousand each, but it's money for schools and things, whatever. Uh, and what we're seeing is this migration of people in the U.S. We're seeing two forms of migration. We're seeing the the state regulatory arbitrage where people are moving from California to. Uh, let's say to Wyoming or to Miami or to uh, Texas. We're seeing that, but we're also seeing people actually exit the country. And with Bitcoin, we're seeing the rise of these digital nomads. I'm, I'm, I know of at least four that I'm regularly talking to. And to be honest, uh, Robert, if my circumstances were different, I would be a digital nomad right now because I've spent a year in lockdown. I've got a state which is becoming very oppressive. I've, you know, I live in the, one of the most well. London's one of the most surveilled cities in the world. We've got uh, really, really crappy free speech laws here. We've got uh, massive government debt, and you know, a lot of talk of raising in taxes. Corporation tax about to rise. Talks of capital gains taxes, and so my productive output and my uh, investment and in putting my money into Bitcoin is under threat of being uh, taken by the state due to their failures and i'm now looking at what is my optionality so what you're talking about we're starting to see and we talk about this virtual world my business is a virtual world i have eight employees distributed about around the world who i can pay in bitcoin if i want yeah let's throw one more into that i've had all my bank accounts closed down um and that was because i refused to tell them what i was spending all my money on I said this is none of your business. If I've got a complaint, I'll complain. So all these things you're talking about and all these things that are talked about in the book, I'm like experiencing myself and I'm seeing other Bitcoin people experience it. So rather than be a theory, it kind of is playing out now. It, 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 we, again, no question we're in the digital age. I think anyone that denies that is living under a rock. But now we're one year into what I call the inflection point or the acceleration point. And I, now I think we're really starting to see a lot of the, the hypothesis from this book start to really play out. 
it had already nailed a couple of things. It had predicted the rise of social media. Um, it actually predicted the, the use of a pandemic by governments that when people started to protest, governments would try to reinforce uh, the relevance of borders through a, a response to a pandemic. Um, so that's interesting to think about as well. Uh, and I like the, it was, it was Balaji, you said, that did the ascending and descending world. This is much more, this sort of speaks to the broader shift in worldview as well. Whereas in the 20th century, we're much more likely to think in statics, like developed, developing world, right? We, we think that you can label something and that's kind of what it is. First world, second world, third world, things like that. Whereas in the digital age, we've become much more aware of just how fluid and dynamic the world is. And at the bottom of that would be, you know, physics tends to kind of permeate upward how we look at the world. And so we're moving away from the Newtonian model to something more like Einsteinian or quantum, where things are constantly fluid, liquid, in flux. Um, and that, that way of describing the world, ascending and descending, is much more dynamic, let's say, than our, our traditional static viewpoints. And it's a great point, too, that you can't assume that because the United States, for instance, has this legacy infrastructure that made it so superior in this particular age, that that set of advantages carries over to the new competitive playing field. So the, the example, in fact, the opposite is true, but it's something that was once an asset can quickly become a liability. So the the classic example here, I've been talking to Booth recently, about the Booth series is, is the Blockbuster example. They were dominant in content rental, like video games, movies, et cetera, et cetera, because they had this huge network of stores and they had a very uh, efficient logistics network for pumping these things out and getting new releases onto the shelves and whatever, whatever. As soon as Netflix came about um, and became started to capitalize on streaming. So actually streaming this content versus physically distributing it. The very asset that was that that defined Blockbuster's advantage in the marketplace oh, almost overnight became their biggest liability. So all of a sudden they're saddled with all these stores, this this large distribution network, logistics infrastructure, all of the employees, right, that have been trained and dialed in on this mode of distribution. It's rendered irrelevant almost overnight. So you're at your greatest asset can flip to be your greatest liability almost instantaneously in the digital age. Um, and another you know, possibility of that is something like 3D printing. Like this could this can occur on a much larger scale as well. Whereas today we have uh, China serving as the production factory, largely for the United States, but also many other places in the world. There's a huge amount of capital invested in that, that logistics infrastructure. If 3D printing becomes mainstream, which it's something like when you look again, looking at the economics of it, it's not making a prediction, it's just saying, okay, what can a 3D printer do? And it turns out it can produce, today it's being used to produce uh, high cost, low volume parts, way better than, some, than the China model, we'll say. So for custom pieces on a boat or something like that, you can render a piece for, say, 150th the cost that's 10 times as good in quality. Um, but as that becomes more mainstream and people can just download uh, an idea, right, the software blueprint for whatever the thing is they're going to print, print it in their home or print it somewhere nearby, you've now collapsed the cost of distribution again. You've informationalized this product. So all of a sudden, this this logistics infrastructure that you know, say the United States has with China, that all becomes a huge liability, and therefore, ascending world, the developing world, can potentially have a very large advantage in this transition. Um, there, there's the example of Africa, right, where they actually leapfrogged the tele telecoms. Um, telecoms roll out where they were because they didn't have this legacy infrastructure that we have to upgrade here in the US, you know, we had to go from 
telegraphs to telephones to 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, whatever, uh, Africa was able to adopt the latest and greatest much more quickly. So it gave them a lot more agility um, to move faster than a develop, developed world or descending world competitor. And that's, that's a good way to look at it, too, because you're getting these uh, more nimble, more modern um, territories, right, that, that have adopted the latest and greatest technology without being burdened by the liabilities associated with legacy technology. Those become much more attractive. They can, they can move faster. They can create more wealth. There's less cost involved in them. And in a world where state revenues are declining, because people have recourse to something like Bitcoin, they can opt out of predatory tax regimes, they can opt out of overly inflationary regimes, they can just put their savings in the offshore bank of Bitcoin, state revenues are going to be declining. So the, the states that have the least liabilities, like in the US, we have just a black hole of unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, Social Security, all of this. It's this tremendous number that will never be paid. So, by the way, if you're in your 30s or 40s or younger and you think you're going to ever draw Social Security, um, I, I would check your check your hope on that. Um, the authors make the point that in this world, people will start to migrate to the states that are the most technologically agile, that have uh, the lowest liabilities because revenues will be in decline. So states with lower liabilities will be more solvent uh, and therefore less predatory, right? They're going to, they'll be less likely to um, overly inflate or overly tax um, their citizens. So I think that's a great way to look at it. It's, it's instead of thinking of the world in static terms, we need to think in a rate of change terms. And because the rate of change now is the big deal. So things can move so quickly when you're on an exponential scale that you can go like something we just went through, right? Bitcoin was under $4,000 a year ago and it's 50,000 today. The bull market just started. And it's probably never going under 20,000 again. Yeah, probably not. It might ne yeah, without a black swan reason, it might never go under 30,000 again. And there's a chance it shoots up to 100,000 at some point this year. And yeah, and we get a new base, and we, the yeah. same cycle repeats itself. Yeah, if we use the last cycle as a proxy, it never went below three times its prior all-time high. So we'd expect it to run up some blow-off top if the cycle repeats, and then it would never come down below, say, 60K. But we also have this change in situation with Bitcoin where people of previous cycles have tried to pick a top or tried to sell or tried to predict it. But people are now thinking, I have this pristine asset. If I time it wrong, I may end up uh I may end up through a certain trading period with less Bitcoin than I had previously, and that's not going to work for me. So rather than play those cycles, I'm going to hold on to that pristine asset like Sailor talks about, and I'm going to leverage the the cheap, weak sovereign currency for my day-to-day -day needs and uh so that puts you know, additional pressure on uh on bitcoin because it lowers the available supply um which becomes becomes a, a an accelerator for this kind of bitcoin world which itself is super interesting yeah it's absolutely right that bitcoin is the tip of the spear on this whole thing by the way and it's as uh the authors have this quote. They say, quote, when the greatest tax haven of them all is fully open for business, all funds will essentially be offshore funds at the discretion of their owner, unquote. That's what Bitcoin is. It is the ultimate offshore bank that with no counterparty risk. Right? You still had counterparty risk in the offshore banking model. That was the preferred means of wealth preservation, access, et cetera, in the 20th century. Because they had, they had built a business around it, frankly. Like Swiss banks had built a business around being uh, anonymous and secure and high, high accessibility. Um, they had good terrain, by the way, for protecting you know, 
Switzerland had geopolitical neutrality, plus they had good terrain, which makes them kind of hard to invade. So they were this uh, analog offshore bank, if you will, for most of the world. A lot of a lot of this happened when Europe was uh, imposing really heavy taxes in the, the re- reconstruction period. A lot of people moved their capital into Swiss Switzerland to protect it from that taxation. So now. The analogy is great. And I go into this in the next part two of the piece that I'll publish that is that title, Bitcoin, the ultimate offshore bank. We have this mode of capital preservation that offers, you know, orders of magnitude, more privacy, accessibility, uh, inviolability than the, than the Swiss bank. Plus, you have no counterparty risk. So that's the other, I think that's the useful framing is that people are like, oh, what is Bitcoin? Why would anyone use it? It's magic internet money. It's like, no, 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 no. Like offshore banking is a $40 trillion market in the world today. Uh, you know, gold's 10 trillion. They're both trying to serve more or less the same purpose. It's trust minimized wealth preservation over time. And to that end, to, satis- to the end of satisfying that want, there is no better tool in the world than Bitcoin. And so as people awaken to that and they start to move their savings into Bitcoin, that's what drives this collapse in state revenues in both unilateral taxation and inflation. Well, yeah, because if the if if there is a collapse in revenue from taxation, um, and the tax and the tax uh, receipts can't cover the outgoing government cost, then as you know, they have to increase spending, as we've seen with these stimulus packages. I mean, the UK now has got, I think it's. Uh, its highest debt to GDP ratio position since something like the 1960s. It's something ridiculous. Um, and we're about to see an impact on tax. And the funny thing is, even with the raising of the tax, this $2.2 trillion bet, uh, debt that the UK has is it, never going to be paid off. It's never going to happen, but they will inflate it away. And so you get people in a position, and I think what's going to happen with this kind of, with, with this transition to Bitcoin, we, we're creating we mint in new Bitcoin millionaires. We mint in new Bitcoin whales all the time. And I think at the, I can't remember what the price is, but somebody recently told me about a price where a certain price where Bitcoin reaches, there will be half the world's billionaires will be Bitcoiners. And uh, will be Bitcoiners. There's like a certain price. Um, so, you know, these millionaires, multimillionaires, billionaires who aren't happy with their services provided by their government aren't happy with the conditions are happily going to migrate, become digital nomads, go to you know, friendly uh, jurisdictions, your Portugal's, your Malta's, your Estonia's, your Cayman Islands. Your, and that's going to, again, that's going to be another wealth drain out of these Western nations. Again, accelerating it. Everything feels like, uh, and it, it's like the um, Parker Lewis gradually then suddenly, everything feels like this acceleration of what is happening here. But what was quite interesting i'm referring back to your notes anyone listening uh mr breedlove has produced an outstanding set of notes uh taxing authorities have grown accustomed and you mentioned this earlier to treating their taxpayers as a farmer treats his own cows keeping them in a field to be milked in the digital age these cows grow wings and we're seeing that yeah and i that's one side of it right like the 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 taxpayers which this is that is the productive base on which all politics rest. It needs a productive economy to siphon wealth off of, to, to be a non-productive politician, let's say. And there's no such thing as a productive politician, by the way. I make this point in the piece that the legislator's pen cannot create wealth. It can only redistribute wealth. So I think that's the big awakening here as well, is that we're moving from a world where we thought somehow that by virtue of a popularity contest, we could put a guy in office that could make things better. And it's just silly. It's just a silly, nonsensical notion. Um, it's consumed a lot of our, our cognitive space. Like if you go and talk to just, at least in America, you talk to your normal American They've got some big opinion about politics and how this guy is better than that guy or this girl is better than this girl. It's like, it's all the same. It is all the same. None of it will ever create the outcome you want. 
The only outcome is they will plunder the Commonwealth to their own benefit. They will serve their central bank masters. That's the only guarantee in this whole game. Um, and at the other side of the, so that's the taxpayers, right? The other side of that is who you alluded to, these, these ultra rich. Typically in these transitions, governments become increasingly desperate, you know, as um, the taxpayers are getting increasingly upset and distrustful of the government. They start to demand these exotic things like MMT, wealth tax, exit tax, you know, the taxes become disproportionately skewed on the wealthy. There's a lot of anger towards the wealthy. I'm debating with people on Twitter sometimes telling me how evil Jeff Bezos is, like how he is the incarnation of evil. Now, having no conception of entrepreneurship or how much productivity, say, Bezos's business has added to the world, he has decreased the cost of living for people worldwide. Now, not to say it's a he's a pure entrepreneur, like he's benefited a lot from the fiat currency spigot as well, largely because Amazon was it was able to outrun state laws and state taxes in the early days. So again, they were able to decrease the cost of distribution relative to a Walmart or whoever else. Um, so had he, he may have not been as successful in a truly capitalistic world. Who knows? But to say he's evil is, is silly. You're shooting yourself in the foot. If you don't want rich problem solvers. It's that statement we saw regularly during uh, whenever Bernie Sanders is campaigning is that billionaires should not exist. Right. Which What's is obviously that? a deeply flawed statement on so many de- levels, but the concept that they shouldn't exist puts a cap on yes. production. Right. Which is just as bad as minimum wage, right? It creates its opposite effect. You put a cap on wealth, then you're going to suppress problem solving in the world. You're going to increase the set of problems in the world. Um, and by the way, which is so silly for a guy like that to say that is we billionaires shouldn't exist. We're going to go print $10 trillion to give everyone helicopter money. It's like you're going to make everyone a billionaire, right? We're going to be like Zimbabwe eventually. And, uh, was it Zimbabwe? Everyone was a billionaire, a trillionaire. Yeah. It's Venezuela as well. And I think Venezuela have just minted their million Bolivar notes this week. I think I saw, I could be right. I saw that government. Uh, let's say ineptitude kind of reaches its climax, which I think we're near today. Uh, people that are dispossessed because the government, the central bank specifically, has been printing money, which confiscates wealth from those that depend on the store of value function of dollars or euro or whatever it is the most. So it's dispossessing people in the socioeconomic hierarchy, it's enriching those that are already rich. This is the classic, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. When that hits a tipping point and the, the middle class has been eviscerated enough, people rise up, right? There's populism, there's revolt, there's anger. And that becomes expressed through the voting mechanism, um, through public demonstration, through riots and protests. And eventually politicians will capitulate and they will start to try and he- more heavily tax the rich and I think when that happens, actually, overlaid with Bitcoin being the only monetary medium available in the world that is totally immune to wealth redistribution, which is to say confiscation, I think that's going to be a major tipping point and that billionaires start to protect themselves from government overreach in Bitcoin. And that is only going to accelerate the need for government to print even more money um, to, to deliver helicopter money and, and what have you. And I just don't see that being reversible because, I've you know, what, the other funny thing about Bitcoin is nobody becomes less bullish. Do you know anyone that's sort of interacted with Bitcoin and bought a little bit and then backed up? I mean, I'd, you could maybe argue a few of these crypto jokers that are trying to peddle the shit coin, but anyone that's taking a serious look at it. No one becomes less bullish. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I can think of key interviews I've done in the last year, which have made me more bullish, which have led me to buy more Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, specifically one with our mutual friend, Brandon Quitton, where we discussed the fourth oh, yeah. turning. That's a great episode. Um, and, yeah, the, the episode I made with Nick Bartia discussing layered money. Uh, I did an episode with Ben Prentice and, and Heavily Armed Clown discussing 
what the fuck happened in oh and guy swan actually no i discussed this, um my episode with stephanie kelton and uh you get to that point with it i mean i think i think if you have the benefit of a full cycle so you've ridden a bear market and you're now in the green it mm-hmm. becomes a lot easier to remain bullish because you yeah. should be able to survive another bear market yes your value in pounds dollars might drop but you, once you can ride out any bear market, you've essentially got to fuck you money stage, and then you, you obviously you 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 don't become less bullish. Um, and what happens is, I think also over time, what's happened this cycle, a lot of your other fears start to to drop away. I think we now have, I've talked about it a few times. I think we have this regulatory moat around us now. Mm-hmm. We're not fully protected, but we have a certain amount of protection with the amount of money that's in Bitcoin, the fact that Tesla in Bitcoin, that Square's yeah. in Bitcoin, that Mike said, we have these people there. If the regulators try and push too far, if they try and put too onerous regulations in place, we have this push- pushback. Yeah. I think certain states could still ban Bitcoin. I still think Brazil, India, Russia, those types of more authoritarian states could still ban it. I think in Europe and the US and the Western nations, I think it's a little bit more difficult. But you're right. Um, I think what happens is you become more bullish and I think you become more fearful of holding sovereign currencies, which I have. Considering this ultimate Bitcoin offshore bank and considering people don't become less bullish, considering this kind of the incentive model for Bitcoin... There's two things I think about with regard to the state wrapped around the idea of this kind of transition period. Um, I'm often, you know, when I'm discussing with libertarians, I'm often thinking with regard to the state, there are politicians or there are people who are naturally evil or who are naturally power hungry. But I don't believe every politician is, whether or not we believe they're all have add, add no value or take value away. I still believe some politicians themselves are institutionalized to the idea that we need the state and politics is a natural part of life and they go in with good intention. I do believe there are politicians with good intention. So I'm often thinking, well, why why is the outcome always the same? Or why is the outcome always negative? And I think it's just the the way the game theory of politic, politics plays out um, and the way that politicians tend to be, you know, protect the state and protect their own jobs and protect their own interests. Yes. As we all know, during a pandemic, no politicians stopped getting paid or were furloughed or lost twenty percent of their revenue of their salary. Um, so I do start to think about. You know, we do have this regulatory moat around Bitcoin at the moment. It probably isn't seen as too much of an existential threat to the state, but based on the theory of uh, the sovereignism and the sovereign individual, that it is ultimately an existential threat. So I'm interested in like the transition period how will the state react what kind of reaction will we see and you know um as you put in your notes so the government has grown used to enjoying a monopoly over currency that they could depreciate as well they're going to lose inflation as a revenue options like and as you've said here like individuals are now free to opt into the most user-friendly monetary policy ever zero terminal inflation rate like i am interested in this transitional period, what's the state reaction going to be? Are we going to see some kind of war? Are we going to see an attack on Bitcoin? It, you know, uh, Neil Woodford talked about this. He said the real battles to come with Bitcoin. You know, the civil world war. You know, we've had the Bitcoin civil war. The real battle is going to become with the state when they realise the existential threat that it is to who they are. How much have you thought about this? Yeah, it's the most it's the greatest known unknown you know we alluded to earlier black swans unknowable unknown this is we know this is a threat to bitcoin right actually bitcoin is designed around this entire threat it's designed to be survivable through a nation state attack through through concerted nation state hostility even uh, bitcoin and has made every engineering trade-off possible to optimize for survivability for this very reason, right? it is the the ultimate enemy of the state, if you will, properly understood. Now, when you start to actually talk to politicians and and central bankers about this, I don't know that they fully see and grasp its implications at this point. Um, I would say it's 
becoming again with number go up, it's increasingly clear that this thing is a it's a big deal. Um, but you would expect at some point there to be this self preservation Darwinian like response from the institutions that face an existential threat from Bitcoin. Um, and I don't know my my thinking on it. My thinking on it now is actually that so you, you alluded to earlier that there's we tend to think there are certain bad good people, bad people, or right? good bad apples, good apples. I actually think that people and their characters are emergent properties of the incentive structures they are operating within. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, which a lot of people don't seem to get when I say it, but I think it's very deep and meaningful is that human nature is like water. It takes the shape of its container. So there have been a number of experiments run where you, if you put a person in a position of authority or they have a certain asymmetric advantage over another, they tend to kind of fill that role, you know? This is Stanford Prison Experiment. That's right. The exact one. But if you put them into a situation where the rules are, you know, fair, fixed, equitable, then people are going to adapt to the, again, the most advantageous strategy, which in that situation would be long-term cooperation um, or fair competition, you would say, based on those rules. So I think the where Bitcoin takes us is that we today we have politics as a scaled out affair, right? We in the U.S. are concerned about what political happenings are occurring in Washington, D.C., Right. Uh, even if you're in California on the west side of the country, that's only because there is a monopoly on money. If there's no monopoly on money, you're going to really quickly disregard what's happening in the political sphere at the other end of the world. Um, this. So another way to say this is that when you move out of fiat currency and into Bitcoin, extortion is no longer scalable. So you're not able to, to suffer under this this invisible form of extortion we call inflation or unilateral taxation. Um, and, and politics itself and government reverts back to a more localized affair. So as far as what, uh, and, and so we can think here too, that the, the other flaw in thinking that I think is really important to flesh out, and this is really common with a lot of macro guys and girls, right? Uh, oh, China owns Bitcoin. The United States will never let it happen. Like they talk in these economic aggregates as if there's a single indivisible unit in the world called China or the United States. And it's just not reality. It's not real at all. What is real is that we have this more or less tightly uh, grouped constellation of mutual interest sociocultural affiliation, geopolitical affiliation, whatever it may be, that comprises the nation state. So it's not like China is this, I mean, um, China would say has the CCP, which tends to be a little more singular directive in action. So the, it behaves more like an indivisible aggregate, but something like the United States is much more decentralized, we'd say, even though there's a strong federal government. It doesn't mean that the, the U.S. moves as like one single entity in all areas uh, of decision making. And so what I see happening here is that every one of these, uh, you know, judges, policemen, arbitrators, every, everyone that works in the government, they have a dual hat. They have another hat they wear as a citizen, basically. So they're engaging with Bitcoin, maybe through two different lenses. One is, hey, I need to go do my job and like make my boss happy. He needs to make his boss happy and, and respect the, the government bureaucracy. Uh, and, and we could put central banks under this umbrella, anything, any government bureaucracy. But they're also operating with this hat of, hey, I'm a citizen. I need to protect my wealth. I need to provide for my family, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what I think will happen here is that as you know, the magic of Bitcoin number go up technology, right? The harder government squeeze, the more they try to, to confiscate, inflate, increase taxes, et cetera, the more 
people are going to slip between their fingers into this ultimate offshore bank of Bitcoin, which increases its market cap. And as we all know, incentives, again, human nature like water takes the shape of its container. Incentives shape reality for you. If you're a Bitcoin holder and all of a sudden it's you know 10x in price, you're going to maybe think a little differently about how you treat it from a, a regulatory standpoint as an individual, right? And maybe that shapes how your boss looks at it. Or maybe he's also bought a little bit to protect himself from inflation. So the analogy I make is that I think Bitcoin acts as this digital asset that's kind of dissolving the, the incentives that, that, that bound nation states and institutions together. I think it kind of dissolves them from within. Um, I, I go into this in, in the piece, actually, there's, there's a psychological experiment called the selective attention experiment. And it, a psychologist assigns a task to uh, the, exper- the, the uh, people in the experiment, and they're watching a video. It's a short video, 20 seconds long, people with black shirts and white shirts. And they say, all right, you watch the people in the black shirts count how many times they pass the basketball back and forth. They're all in a basketball court running around, passing the ball. And so you do that, you engage with the task, you count the number of passes, the basketball. And then at the the end of this 20 second video, the experimenter asks you, so how many times do they pass the basketball? And you know, whatever, seven, eight, 10, whatever the number is. Then the experimenter asks, okay, thank you. Did you see the six foot man in a gorilla costume walk into the middle of the frame of the video, flail his arms about for five seconds and then walk off screen? And like 75% of the people don't see it. I didn't see it. I know the video. I didn't see it. If you go, and it's great, it's on YouTube. You can go yeah. do it yourself. Like, granted, once you know it, you sort of see yeah, it. And I know, you know, but if someone gets you with this without describing it to you in full, like it, it's, it's been repeated many times. Seventy-five percent of the people don't see it. So the moral of the story there is that your your incentives or your the the aim of your goal directed action determines not only how you see the world, but it determines what you see in the world. Literally, don't see that guy in the gorilla suit if you're not if there's no incentive for you to look for him. Basically, you're following the passes. And I think that Bitcoin will shape not only how regulators in their in their role as citizens see the world, but will also shape what they see in the world. We'll start to look at this uh, alternative financial system differently. And then to your point earlier, we already have this regulatory moat where every time a Square, a Tesla, a MicroStrategy, any of these uh, major public equities take a position, they bring with them an army of lobbyist influence, you know, uh, political affiliation, et cetera. So it becomes really hard to resist at some point. And I think instead of there being this, I'm sure there's going to be a counterstroke from the state. I'm sure there's going to be some fight, but I think it's going to be less of this epic battle between Bitcoin and the state. It's going to be more of like the state dissolving into Bitcoin over time. There will be people on the side of the state. We've already seen... The typical kind of arguments that, and it feels like people who think they've missed out. I certainly think there's some people who feel like they've missed out and therefore they want to be anti Bitcoin and they'll pick up whichever, the, the mainstream press do a lot, pick up whatever kind of FUD there is, like tether, the tether FUD until the tether FUD passed away and that's gone now. Now it's energy FUD, whatever it is. I certainly think there's there's that. I also certainly think there's people who just do not agree that. Um, the idea of you know a full anarchist world is better than one with states and countries, and and some people believe that despite all the flaws, we are better off with the state. We're better off with that pull and pull of democracy, even with its flaws, because without that, we don't have like the book does comment on this. We don't have a, 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 a working example of a operational country which is essentially anarchist in nature or or without a state i myself still can't get myself to a position of that but i do like the idea of a smaller state i do like the idea of uh bitcoin dissolving in uh, sorry the state dissolving into bitcoin but providing a service you know that that and they are you know forced within that provision of that service 
to keep to a budget because they don't have the ability to print money as they do now. Um, so that transitional period is the thing I'm thinking about. Where do we end up? Where do we become? And 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 it reminds me of a conversation I had with Eric Voorhees a long time ago. He said, you know, despite him being a, um, a libertarian, he's like, I'm not calling for the end of the state now. What I'm calling for them is to get smaller, just 5% smaller next year and see what happens. And for me, what this becomes is almost like an A-B test of the state of what can they provide or what should they provide. You know, if they are restricted to a budget, what do they? What services do they drop first? And it then becomes perhaps that we do operate with a state, but a much smaller state, you know, in a different way that's providing services which, you know, are um, subject to the free market. No, it's a great point. Um, I would argue that his, there is no historical example of this, you know, crypto anarchist ideal of social organization because of what we're talking about, by the way, right? Money has always been confiscatable. Coercion and violence has always been useful because we didn't have digital technology. We didn't have encryption, frankly, to put these things, whether it's capital, commercial relationships, ideas, we could put them behind an impenetrable digital wall. Now, we didn't have that defender's advantage in any of the analog ages, right? Agricultural, industrial. So that's why I'm, in this piece, I'm like, I've called Bitcoin before this, it enables this purified form of capitalism, but I think you just have to almost give it an entirely new name because nothing like this was possible before Bitcoin and encryption tech, essentially. That's the big change here. Um, and at a really fundamental level, the book goes into this, I'll try to do it justice, but this is something rooted in mathematics that mm -hmm. Encryption itself, it's very easy to multiply prime numbers, but it's very easy to divide them and determine if they're prime. So it makes the point that this simple asymmetry in the math, the structure of mathematics itself actually creates this defender's advantage that, that reshapes society. Um, I don't know that I did that on justice perfectly, but I would say go check that out in the book. It's, it's, it, it, talk about first principles, right? It's like we've discovered something in mathematics effectively, that causes us to reorganize ourselves. So it's super bottom up. Um, but to the point on democracy, that's, another, that's what the free market is, by the way. It is a pure democracy. It's economic democracy. It's we're all voting with our, our buying and trading and selling decisions. And since Bitcoin enables that um, in a more pure sense, we're going to have this miniaturization of the state, which is not, a, it's going back to what it was originally as a localized protection service. So whatever physical capital we have locally that needs to be defended and protected, the state would provide that. Um, but on something like Bitcoin, those property rights are being defended by, by the mining network, right? It's in the, the, the defense is inbuilt into the money almost. So, yeah, that's just a, a, another way to look at it is that we've just reduced the need of citizens for the protection service itself because the assets being protected uh, are now, it's the securities integrated into the asset with Bitcoin. And then the state also, or the, the, state, the book also goes into, and this is a, a prediction we've yet to see play out, that we would see the, the broader digitization of property rights as well. Um, and I heard a really interesting podcast. I forget the gentleman that was on there, but he's discussing RGB, which is a, you know, a third layer protocol on top of Bitcoin, how it actually can enable a lot of these contractual relationships uh, independent of the court system. So who knows, you know, Bitcoin may underpin even more than we understand today. It could be even more than money. It could be the base layer for, for digitizing uh, tangible property rights as well. But, the big thing here is, I think the other way, to, yet another way to think about this, I know I'm always doing that, but that's how I think. Um, monetization itself shifts our incentives. So whatever we're monetizing, we produce more of. So when we monetize gold, right? Gold, say gold has a $1 trillion market cap for its industrial use, roughly, whatever, electronics, teeth, et cetera. 
Well, gold's market cap is closer to 10 trillion. Why did we produce so much more gold? Because we monetized it, right? There was a demand. Part of its demand configuration was industrial, and part of it was for exchange, monetary use case. So we increased production of gold because we monetized it. Fiat currency is debt. That's what it actually is. It incentivizes you to take on more debt because inflation erodes real debt burdens over time. So we monetize debt in the creation of fiat currency. Where are we at now? We have 350% global debt to GDP and rising. Mm -hmm. um, a, another way to think about that is fiat currency, we always say it's backed by nothing, but it's backed by the anticipated future cash flows of the taxing authority. So fiat currency is backed by coercion and violence. So we have monetized coercion and violence. That is why <laughs> it is we've increased production of coercion and violence at the state level, right? And again, not to say that it's you're shooting people to pay their taxes. It's in the shadow of, of as we just as we defined violence at the beginning of the episode, in the shadow of this uh, unilateral um, imposition or decree or threat of violence or threat of coercion. Um, that's what fiat currency is premised on. And moving into the Bitcoin world, we have a technology, monetary technology that has monetized energy. So now, the, in theory at least, should that, that relationship hold, we would increase the production of energy tremendously. And we would decrease its cost of production. And if you look at something like the, the Kardashev scale, have you heard of this? Where you're like type one mm -hmm. civilization, type two, type three. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, I have, yeah. So type one, I may have the types wrong here, but you've harnessed all the energy on your own planet. Type two, you've harnessed the energy of your solar system. Type three, so on and so forth. And that is the arc of civilization. We, we again, human Human beings are the animals that channel energy across space and time towards the achievement of aims. The more energy we can harness, the more civilized we become. So I think Bitcoin is the gateway uh, to that higher order civilization. And that's what all of like what we're trying to get our head around is that it's this tectonic shift away from statism towards sovereignism. It's funny because I've got a note here. You know, I was going through the notes. Uh, and I'm working on an idea for a show at the moment with Ben Prentice, who's now a producer on uh, what Bitcoin did. And um, we're working on this idea of this show called The Brilliance of Satoshi, like everything he got right. And it's it's really interesting to watch these other shit coins, you know, change their monetary policy or pivot or blah, 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 because they're always trying to reconfigure themselves. Um, but very little of that has had to happen with Bitcoin. It's pretty much out of the box. Its monetary policy has never changed. It seems brilliant in design. Um, but not only that, you know, we're having this quite deep conversation with regards to the future shape of society, you know, this transitional phase. And there's so much deep intellectual discussion uh, by very smart people regarding Bitcoin. And I just put a note here. It's like, I mean, we don't know if Satoshi is alive or not or following this, but I wonder if he really fully comprehended, like if he thought about it, it like this deeply thought that, I wonder if he just thought, look, I'm going to create this form of, you know, money out of, out of reach of government, out of control, you know, with a f fixed supply, you know, trying to make the fairest, hardest, best money there is. Or he actually realized that Bitcoin could be an essential po component of civiliz civilizational change. I mean, we won't know, but I just wonder that. I have a hard time imagining that one guy could, you know, have foreseen all of this. Like this, Bitcoin is such a powerful gravity well in terms of you know, finance, capital, human organization, philosophy. It just, it is an incredible rabbit hole, right? The rabbit hole of all rabbit holes. Clearly, Satoshi was brilliant, he, she, or they, but I have a really hard time imagining they could have envisaged all of these consequences, right? And how fast it's all happened. I mean... Well, it's the hardest question now when people are like, what is Bitcoin? Because it becomes a harder question to answer. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I want to tell you this, but like, 
this little dot, but really it's like all of this. You know, I talk to my son, you know, we have really long conversations about this and I do my best to try and explain it as best I can and in a way that he can understand and comprehend. But it is, it's more than just saying, oh, like, you know, it's hard money, it's digital gold. Like, yeah. you know, based on the theories of, for example, the sovereign individual or based on the potential civilizational change we're going through if we are in the fourth turning, as I discussed with Brandon Quittam, therefore the yeah. importance of Bitcoin, based on all these things, like it's such a deep rabbit hole yeah. um, that, you know, I just... I just, I like I say, I wonder if he fully comprehends, comprehended it. Perhaps he did. Perhaps he, you know, perhaps he read the sovereign individual. Perhaps that was his inspiration. I mean, we'll never know, but it's certainly on my mind. Yeah, I think he, I mean, he probably did read the sovereign individual. Honestly, mm. he was he was very much dialed in to the cyberpunk ethos. You know, he was a cyberpunk, um, but I. You know, it's funny, people talk about the monetary policy of Bitcoin, and it's actually, it obliterates the notion of monetary policy. So we could say that, okay, it was Satoshi's policy. Maybe you could say that, that he just picked a number. But what he was really doing was choosing the fairest rule for money, which is that no one can confiscate it by inflation, right? It's perfectly predictable, perfect information. Uh, that's really just using inflation to bootstrap itself, to bootstrap the network into existence, but there's no unknown inflation. So it actually is, it, it's almost like a form of natural law. So right? he's, he's created this law that exists independently of mankind. So the same way we have to figure out how to deal, how to deal with gravity and how to deal with thermodynamics, we now have to feel, figure out how to deal with 21 million Bitcoin and 0% terminal inflation. And that's why Bitcoin is fuck you money, right? It's fuck you yeah, to every policy, up. every policy, every police state, and every politician in the world. And it's like, that's the power of it. That is the, the core power of it. And that's why it's the tip of the spear to this uh, sovereignism thesis. And in terms of what it is, I agree with you. We have no idea. The same could be the foundation to, um, you know, we talked about property rights earlier. There's lightning network. There's, there's so many u- use cases that are possible on top of it. We don't know. We simply don't know. Um, what I do, one description I do like a lot, though, is that we found a way to mix electricity plus greed and turn it into indisputable truth. Right? Exactly. We just have, we just have electricity to mine. We have Darwinian self-interest, self-preservation. Stir it in a pot, and now we have global indisputable truth for all of us to build our own economic strategies in trying to serve one another and serve ourselves in the process. Dude, listen, I think for a part one, that's a really good point to end it. Um, I think it's a great introduction. There are some other bits we're going to have to cover in a follow-up part. So we've got to look at the historical perspective and see how this plays out. But Man, honestly, I could sit and talk to you for hours, especially through this shit. I learned so much. Um, sometimes I'm like, are we like being weirdos here? Are we being hyperbolic? But <laughs> one of the things I've realized is that I've kind of, I've kind of held off with the more hyperbolic claims of Bitcoiners ever since I've been in, and I've always felt my, found myself apologizing because they're they're often right. I've read a number of things, gone back and read a number of things on uh, Pierre Rochard and Bistine's website. Uh, Nakamoto Institute, they predict they themselves have predicted a lot of what's happened. So now I'm just yeah. I'm just in for the ride. Like I'm I'm in now. Let's see how this plays out. But that's a great start, dude. Listen, just tell people where to follow your work, and we will follow this up with a uh, subsequent parts. Yeah, I'm excited to do that. I think this is uh, a really important text to share. And well, I think we'll once we get done with this, let's open source all the notes. Uh, we can point people to the book online mm-hmm. as well. Um, this is important because this transition, very uncertain. Uh, the most, the best thing you can do is arm yourself with knowledge, I think. So that's why I feel very strongly about what we're doing here and, and, and hopefully the writing too helps. Uh, again, my name is Robert Breedlove. I'm on Twitter at Breedlove22, B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E-2-2. Um, just started the What Is Money show. So there's links there. 
I'm doing these long form intellectual discourse sessions with the most prolific thinkers that will sit down with me. Um, working with Jeff Booth now and yeah, it's similar to what we're doing here. You know, we're going deep on topics and uh, hopefully externalizing the minds of some of these great thinkers for other people to see. And, and um, the quote I heard recently was, I forget who said it, but civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. <laughs> and so, I love it. so we're just trying to, you know, amplify the education side. Well, listen, man. Um, you know what I think of you. I, I think you're one of, if not the most important f- speakers about Bitcoin right now. I think the work you're doing is fantastic. Um, what I love about it is that you're drawing in other voices outside of Bitcoin, other people who are just kind of being tempted by it and they want to talk to you. And I think the work you're doing is important. And I hope some of the most important shows out there start getting you on. I know you've got some stuff coming up. Uh, we've talked about other shows. Hopefully you'll be on, but look, just keep doing what you're doing. It's really, really important work. I'm learning a lot from you and I appreciate everything you do, man. Hey, thank you, brother. I really appreciate you too. And thanks for having me. All right, dude.